Ben 10, Cartoon Network's very own superhero, got really weird as it kept going. Thunderpit! Ah! How'd you like to do me a solid? The fourth Ben 10 series, Omniverse, has a brand new look as it continues the story of a boy who can transform into 10 different superpowered aliens. Then, so many other superpowered aliens. They ended up adding so many aliens that Cartoon Network and their toy manufacturing partner Bandai had to say stop adding so many aliens. There's a guy who's made out of Legos, a guy so scary if you look at him you die or something. A guy who is a miniature planet with a gravitational pull. The electric yeti? Shocks. Squatch? That's so awesome. And then there's a chicken that will actually beat you to death. Woo! Yeah, this is Billiam, and welcome to the final part in my retrospective look on Ben 10. It's been two years in the making, and I left you on a cliffhanger in the last part, knowing it would be a full other year until I got to this part. I do, however, appreciate that one guy who commented on my last Ben 10 video every single day until I posted this video, presumably. Thank you for the encouragement. This video is for you. Unless he doesn't see it and just keeps commenting. Being the fourth Ben 10 iteration, this series has evolved significantly since the first time Ben put on the Omnitrix, a high-tech alien-made device that powers his transformations, all creatively inspired by science fiction, fantasy, and decades of classic comic book storytelling. With such embrace of what came before it, Ben 10 Omniverse has such creative energy and smashes you in the face with a hyperactive intro, featuring both 16-year-old and 11-year-old Ben 10, as this show jumps back and forth in time to tell narratives spanning the series' history. With such a visually distinct style, Omniverse may have turned longtime viewers off, but Omniverse is the first time the animators were running the show. With visually focused storylines that are told through dynamic action sequences and animation, I really love the look. Still, this is the only classic Ben 10 show I did not watch while it was airing, but I was already growing out of Ben 10 during Ultimate Alien. However, revisiting the show now, it's actually become my favorite iteration of Ben 10, I think. It's able to capture everything I appreciate about the series in one beefy package. It's 80 episodes. The sponsor of today's video is AG1. AG1 is an all-in-one nutritional drink that supports things like gut and immune health, endurance, and brain health. Watch out, Jimmy Neutron. Each scoop of AG1 is like nine health products in one. It's like taking a multivitamin or probiotic. It also helps with focus and energy. Ingredients like rhodiola, magnesium, and B vitamins help with sustained energy throughout the day without that dreaded coffee crash, which I'm still in denial of. I must be tired for another reason. Plant extracts, adaptogenic herbs, and antioxidants help with mental clarity and your metabolism. For me, it's just a little extra help staying mentally clear so I can make videos for y'all. To try AG1 yourself, head to my link in the description below and get a one year supply of AG vitamin D3 plus K2, plus five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. Thank you again to AG1 for sponsoring this video. With each new Ben 10 iteration came new regulars to accompany Ben. In the original show, Grandpa Max and Ben's cousin Gwen are on a crazy summer road trip. Then we follow teenage Ben and Gwen teaming up with rival turned ally Kevin Eleven. I love each of these groups for their own reasons, but the now reputable and experienced Ben is introduced to a new partner by Grandpa Max, Rook Blanco, an alien and plumber cadet who plays it by the books. The plumbers are intergalactic peacekeepers that Grandpa Max has been a part of for decades. The reveal is a bit of a punchline in the original series. Grandpa Max isn't the kind of plumber you think he is. He actually blasts aliens, has sex with aliens, eats and cooks aliens. I hope none of the ones he had sex with. At the beginning of their partnership, Ben insists that he is ready to work on his own and doesn't see the point of having Rook for a teammate. He's just a rookie. But with Gwen and Kevin at college, quickly Rook and Ben realize how cool the other one is and form a strong, sustaining bond. Magister Tennyson here says you prefer these Chili fries. Care to join me? Partner. This is a really careful dynamic to get right, and one I was hesitant to want to like. Rook could have easily been a know-it-all, judgmental of his brash partner. Yet refreshingly, Rook's elite training and disconnect to Ben's sense of humor doesn't overcome the fact that he is youthful and very complimentary to Ben's character. Mm, ben. I know, I know, it's sometime food. No, they do not make meatball subs. Is this not a restaurant? Come on, I'll buy you a sub on the way back to the base. That is very kind. I love how their friendship evolves beyond work. Ben will earn the respect of Rook's family to the point where Rook's little brother chooses to name himself after Ben during a ceremony meant to signify his first steps into adulthood. What name do you choose? Henceforth, I will be known as Rook Ben. His tail falls off. You're a grown man now. A tail. Of the impact, it falls off at puberty. 
Stop that. It's an alien Stop thing. that right now. Stop that. Rook also bonds with Ben's friends. He and Kevin are both gearheads while Gwen and Rook text each other, often asking each other for advice. <laughs> Gwen said that would work. It's a friend thing. Ben has many transformations in circulation this series, even long forgotten ones like Eye Guy, who is the worst ever. He only ever appears in two scenes in the original series, both in the finale movie, and one of those scenes is an alternate opening. So you may have only ever seen him in one scene if you've seen the Ben 10 original series finale movie without the alternate openings. His eye stomach pops out for the first time ever in Omniverse. It's like a jump scare. Holy sh**. I had no idea he could do that. And neither did Ben, but they use him enough now to make him more memorable. I love the transformation of Tomics because he sounds like the Bikini Bottom news anchor announcer. Grandfather, keep him safe. Mm, cousin, shield the others. And Atomics is like this super powerful Buzz Lightyear dude. I don't know. Ben unlocks the ability to use Alien X, his most powerful transformation. This device called the Annihilarg is activated and guess what? It blows up the universe. Universe. It's gone. But Alien X just recreates the universe. It's Ben 10 God mode. It was so easy for him to do all of that. He can just do that? In one of the series' best episodes, they put his ass on trial because it turns out you can't just do that. Not without permission. This whole episode is wonderful comedic execution of the insane power is wielding it, the kind of guy he is. I was too late to save the universe and everything in it from being destroyed, so I used Alien X to make an exact duplicate! But I just couldn't get the grape flavor right. Ben had to literally recreate all of his friends and families who disappeared into the nether. And the thing he's upset about is the fact he can't get his favorite smoothie flavor. And he's right. It's a f***ing cartoon. The first major story arc develops between both the past and the present involving a villain who Ben was unable to defeat five years ago. Malware. Malware is like one of Ben's transformations upgrade. Able to manipulate technology. But he looks so much different to see signify his corruption. Malware is on a hate-filled pursuit to destroy his creator, Azmuth, who created the Omnitrix, a mission that started when Ben was just a child. In the past, we learned Ben gained and lost a powerful new transformation, Feedback, but somehow Malware rips Feedback away from the Omnitrix, then flees, claiming to have laid the seeds of his victory for his return five years later. Ben's emotional arc involves the feeling of grief he felt losing Feedback. I'm an open book. Tell me about feedback. That book's closed. A lot of fans connect this to being the reason why Ben takes off the Omnitrix before Alien Force begins, a part of the character's history that wasn't really explored. It ends up feeling very poignant and emotionally true to the existing story. Malware is an important part of Ben's past and he returns partnered with Kyber and Dr. Psychobos, who has boasted about his creation, the Nematrix, to counter the Omnitrix, which is fitted to Kyber's dog, Zed, allowing her, the dog, to transform into the natural predator of Ben's transformation. Transformations. A real animal. The progression of Ben really reminds me of Goku from the Dragon Ball franchise. A lot of fans prefer Dragon Ball Z and the dramatic adult adventures of Goku rather than the silly antics and adventures of Kid Goku in Dragon Ball. Different tones the series has often attempted to try to blend. When they introduced Goku's identical son, then later magically aged Goku back down to a kid, they were trying to recapture the feeling of original Dragon Ball. The different ages of Ben 10 are similar, yet Omniverse is able to blend what came before very well within the five year gap in the story. There's a really great amalgamation between the original show's tone and the continued maturation of the character. 10 year old Ben and teenage Ben have similar personalities, but their major difference is teenage Ben is kind, whereas 10 year old Ben can be very mean. Although this meanness is sometimes echoed in teenage Ben in that he can be inconsiderate, although not outwardly rude. 10 year old Ben is played by Timmy Turner herself, Tara Strong, having more gruff than sass in his voice. I've pummeled a lot of bad guys, but I don't remember punching that face. He's just the cockiest, sarcastic kid you ever met. I don't want any of your spoiling this day. Jeez, is it okay if I breathe? And his little watch makes him the most powerful thing 
in the universe, so you can't do anything about it. Teenage Ben was taken over by Yuri Lowenthal, who adds a lot of sincerity to Ben. His quips highlight the cleverness of the character rather than his meanness. Yet Teenage Ben's characterization was created by writers who did not love the original series. It was a critical take on the character, one that ended up benefiting him in the end. The second show, Alien Force, featured a much more uncertain, kind, and sincere version of Ben. But after Ben saved the universe at the end of the much darker and more serious hybrid arc, the first arc of the series, the network wanted to restore a part of Ben's fun, energetic personality. Despite network interference, the execution never felt regressive to the character for me. It was an evolution. Ben's arrogance as a child is rooted in his uncertainty of himself, where Ben's arrogance as a teenager is rooted in tested confidence, which then in turn makes him comfortable enough to slip into some old habits. Tara Strong's Ben is very mischievous and parallel to Lowenthal's older Ben, the flashbacks have a reflective quality. Ben's bratty attitude is more endearing when we know he grows up to be better. He grows to show love and respect to those he cares about and to a lot of other people. Omniverse has a really great grasp on why the different versions of this character are appealing. It was a very tough balance to reach, but it was a balance that came together through a bunch of clashing perspectives. Collaboration is good? Under the art direction of series co-developer Derek J. Wyatt, they tried to pack in as much action into these episodes as possible. The fighting sequences in Ben 10 have always been good in the sense that they're cleverly choreographed, but Omniverse puts it into double time, drawing what feels like twice as many action poses. Wyatt said it right that UAF, Ultimate Alien and Alien Force, were designed to replicate live action character and camera movement, which I think really complements Alien Force's dramatic beginning. But later when the tone starts to lighten up, it feels very stiff. Like why is his hair so neat and combed? I hate it. Is he combing it with goop goo? My hair looks stupid, my shirt is wrinkled, and I have a zit the size of Kansas. Yeah? Derek J. Wyatt is also known for working on the 2003 Teen Titans series and being the lead character designer on Transformers Animated and Scooby-Doo Mystery Incorporated. I love his work, but in individual fandoms, he's often controversial for what many people consider to be extreme redesigns. I really believe Omniverse's looks complement what Ben 10 had become. It feels like a natural evolution of where the series was going in Ultimate Alien. The character looks how his personality feels with a mischievous little smile and messy hair. Then, as a pair, Rook becomes a great contrast, sporting a slick, clean-cut look. Gwen's features are reminiscent of her original design, making her more colorful, youthful, and less formal-looking. Please, call me Gwendolyn. Ugh, really, Gwen? Dylan. And Kevin gets a less handsome, more grunge look, which adds to his gritty and dark personality. And Grandpa's white pants and action-packed settings communicates his confidence. I just don't wear white pants. Unlike previous Ben 10 shows, the production was described as animator-focused, with Derek J. Wyatt and others on the animation side being present during story meetings and having a louder creative voice as a natural part of the process. The aliens are all updated as well. Wyatt's dynamic shape language makes all of the aliens old and new feel unique and exotic from each other. The Omnitrix watch transforms around each species, making it a cool accessory to each alien rather than this weird implant. Forearms now has like a circus strongman look. Heat Blast feels hotter with a black molten core and Big Chill has become huge chill. Jury Rig used to be this naked little demon, but now his mechanical abilities are highlighted by his fresh fit. He feels like a pilot mechanic. Fellas, if Jury Rig can look hot, so can you. Ladies too. And if you's non binies that's cool with Ben 10. Just just look at the wiki. Omniverse deepens the world through exploring characters of the same species Ben can transform into. As noted in this Q&A with Wyatt, previous Ben 10 shows would often introduce characters that look like copies of Ben's transformations. Omniverse makes a point to make every alien feel like its own character with a unique personality-driven design, making them distinct from Ben's transformations even if they're from the same species. Can anybody read me? Stop the team! Anybody? Ben meeting other big muscular cat aliens like his transformation wrath makes and realize he's been running around naked for many seasons. It's hilarious. So of course we wear pants! But that would mean... Bug. <laughs> then characters like Blue Kick and Dreba, who are a part of the same species as Ben's super smart gray matter transformation, are explained to be really dumb for their species, but really smart for Earth. The title Omniverse alludes to the multiverse stories, introducing and featuring old and new alternate versions of Ben. Ben from Universe 23 has a blue color palette and his spoiled attitude is comedically undermined by his uncreative alien names, like Big Bug or I Guy. Yeah, I gotta admit, the name's pretty lame. Damn, I Guy sucks in every single dimension. 
Ben 10,000 from the future returns. Ben starts to become as powerful as he is, but then Ben 10,000 buys a second Omnitrix. Mangasaur! So he gets to fuse his aliens, something that was once played with in the original series. Not the best combo. Like Atomic X, Big Chuck, Uprig, or Humong Goop Soar. The number and variety of aliens introduced creates an abundance of creativity. Even though the network told them to chill out with how many aliens they were adding, it always feels fresh and new. Ben 10 was introduced as Cartoon Network's flagship action show in 2005. You got 10 minutes, Gramps. Yeah, yeah. Ben 10 Alien Force and Ultimate Alien were popular when Cartoon Network was going through their real life era, where they weren't even airing cartoons no more. Now, see your favorite characters come to life. As more colorful shows like Adventure Time became a part of the network's identity, Ben 10 was left feeling very dry. Omniverse visually gives Ben 10 the Cartoon Network flavor it deserves. It's here. <laughs> It's Cartoon Network Super. Awkward. At its start, Omniverse already had such a rich tapestry for Ben and Rook to explore, with past characters anchoring us to many corners of this world. Gwen, Kevin, and Grandpa may be out of the main cast, but side stories hit hard when they help guide us through. Ben's hometown Bellwood has developed a whole alien community underneath the city, Undertown, a hub for alien life on Earth. They continue to use alien societal integration as an allegory for immigration and cultural acceptance, especially through Rook. Rook takes Ben to Ravana, his home planet, where Ben learns about his his heritage. They celebrate this all-purpose fruit, Amber Ogia, that they work for unconditionally until it's harvest. This makes Rook becoming a plumber very taboo. He's got a farm, but he and his family work through it. Then Ben, who is a huge flirt in Omniverse, meets Esther, the leader of some aliens that live deep underground. Start digging, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Atea, the empress of the incursions, is into him as well. Luma is the princess of the forearms species, and she really likes Ben. If you look like this, call me. I will count your arms. There better be four. And boy, oh boy, does Ben 10 love the attention. 10 out of 10, Ben 10 again. Kai Green hasn't been seen since the first series, and amongst all of Ben's love interests, she is the only one who prefers one of his transformations, Ben Wolf. It's just her deal. She's another kin, and she's Ben's future wife. She really loves that wolf, but she hates that she and Ben get married in the future. They find out and they hate it for now. Their child Ken is actually introduced in the original series and is reintroduced here in a big reveal, being the secret identity of the time traveling Chrono Spanner. Chrono Spanner goes back in time to make sure his parents get together, ruining Ben and Esther's relationship, but she was already into Antonio. Wait, that fuck Freaky guy who dated Ben and Gwen's cousin. Antonio fights for love. The previously naked, now fully dripped up Antonio. He's looking slick. Ben's old girlfriend, Julie, is nowhere to be found until we find out Ben accidentally broke up with her while playing video games. He's never been good at communication. And it's funny to see play out when he doesn't have bad intentions. There's also a crossover episode with the show called The Secret Saturdays about a family of cryptozoologists. And apparently this confirmed that these two shows like definitively take place in the same universe. And Ben, he likes the guy's mom. She goes on a game show to try to compete for Ben. Like this woman needs to chill. The Y timeline and time travel creates a cool opportunity for storytelling, even in one-off episodes like Ben Again. Ben Again has a fun temporal spin on the old body swap story trope, having young and teenage Ben's mind swap through time. Ben has to leave present day Gwen clues in the past so his younger self can revert back to their own minds before Eon, evil Ben from another timeline where Ben turns evil, takes full control of their timeline. It's a time travel thing. Eon's first introduced in the live action Ben 10 movie. <laughs> It's almost over. Epic. B for Ben 10. In a non-time travel story, Ben's adversarial relationship with Mr. Bowman, a shop owner in Bellwood, is told over a decade in the episode, The Ballad of Mr. Bowman. It's like Dennis the Menace and Mr. Wilson. Mr. Bowman! If Dennis the Menace had a bomb strapped to his wrist called the Omnitrix. After years of Ben f***ing up Bowman's car and shops, he needs Ben's help to save his secret alien fish girlfriend who crash landed on Earth many moons ago. Grandpa Max totally gets it, but Ben, he's got some catching up to do. Huh? A fish girl? There are 
eight seasons of this show, all of which technically have their own little subtitle. Most of the show is episodic, but oftentimes themes and characters will tie episodes together. The beginning sees Ben and Rook get their rhythm together. The Nemetrix works as the perfect literal device to get the rookie Rook and Ben to make their partnership work. Ben can't beat the Nemetrix's specific advantages over the Omnitrix. He does, in fact, need a partner. Ben having to face against this old villain malware makes him face his past mistakes Mistakes, forgiving himself for losing feedback and probably for being a big ass too, which allows him to regain his transformation feedback. An alien with no natural predator. That's terrifying. He defeats malware. Then season three pits Ben and Rook against the crazy frog meets Battletoads Empire of the Incursions. They're ugly frogs from space and want to take over Earth, but their empress, Atea, is real cute and she and Ben keep crossing paths as I've already mentioned. Season five is the only only season to have a unique intro, it's spooky themed and features the season title Galactic Monsters right on the intro card. Episodes heavily feature those ghouls like Ghost Freak, Ben's escaped alien from the Omnitrix, or as we learn his true name, The Scare. That's so lame. More like the lame. Ben actually once again gets to transform into Ghost Freak, but now the transformation has all these chains around it. You want Ghost Freak? You got it. So it can't escape. So that's kind of messed up. Best not to think about it. Then Gwen's evil sorceress rival Charmcaster becomes a big threat despite her uncle Hex starting life as a college professor with Gwen as a star pupil. A fun twist of events considering Charmcaster had felt like she could potentially turn, but now she's more evil than ever. Later, the villain Albedo is reintroduced. He's the former apprentice of Asmuth who built himself a new knockoff Omnitrix, a second Ultimatrix. Previously on Ben 10 Alien Force, I've done it. I've recreated the power of the Omnitrix. Not only can I transform into anything you can, but I can also evolve those creatures. I never liked Ben having the Ultimatrix. The Ultimatrix was lame in the last series, Ultimate Alien. But being something that's reintroduced as a tool exclusively for the villain makes it work for me. It gives Albedo a natural advantage over Ben instead of like an exact copy of all of his powers. However, after Ultimate Albedo loses, he once again gets stuck looking like Ben. This is his default appearance since he copied the Omnitrix. Ben's DNA is the human sample. What could be worse than being transformed into a 16-year-old Ben Tennyson? It's a very funny turn of events, made even funnier when another glitch in the Ultimatrix makes him appear as 10-year-old Ben, a wonderful joke made better by the villainous presence of the most powerful ass in fiction. 10-year-old Ben 10. This arc also features Ben's last new alien in the classic timeline, Wampire. Wait. After this, Bandai and Cartoon Network said, we need to market the aliens we have rather than introducing an infinite number of aliens. Stand by for the alien collection figures from the Ben 10 Omniverse series. Ben 10, extremely cool vehicle. The slime drool of wild He can pick voices that sound so real. <laughs> Crush the evil vil guy and shred on the skateboard ramp. Ben 10 Deluxe Omnitrix, add the powder, water, alien, good. Time to rock and roll. With his new Alien Force Ultimate Omnitrix, create your own aliens with the Alien Creation Chamber. And with his awesome transforming action cruiser. With the awesome humongous all hands. With the help of the Echo Echo Voice Changer. And create a brain for Brainstorm. Ben 10 Alien Swarm Cycle. Ben 10 Plumber's Communicator. Call up Grandpa Max. Hello, Ben. Now grab the amazing Ben 10 Laser Lance. Pop the lineup gun sub. It's hero time. Ultimate Alien Collection, DNA, Alien Gear, the awesome Ben 10 Jet, the exclusive Ben figure, and unleash the car. Any clear figure that you can use with the amazing revolution Ultimatrix. It's hero time. Flip the lid. It's hero time. Despite this, however, there weren't many more plans to introduce new aliens. Allegedly. Creatives on the show, including Derek J. Wyatt, had a love for the original Ben 10 series and retained creative respect for later elements while having the creative interest to tell new stories. With revisiting so many classic characters while inviting in new creative voices, it eventually becomes necessary to do things differently or explain away things the audience was already familiar with. This is important because canon can become a burden to writers who might be weighed down and unable 
able to tell the best story they're the most excited about. Canon and continuity are important. I just spent an entire video about how they reference and celebrate old things throughout the entire series. But at the end of the day, if an IP is going to continue indefinitely, contradictions are going to happen. And there's a difference between contradictions that are just blatant disregards and ones that are just a new take on things. Kevin Levin was not written to be a half alien in the original series. This storyline was added later and really expanded upon in the Agrigor arc, which introduced Kevin's real father, the alien Agrigor. Previously on Ben 10 Ultimate Alien. I'll be ready to absorb the powers of all five of those aliens. I'll be unstoppable. He wants to aggregate the most powerful aliens, revealing Kevin's knowledge of his heroic plumber father to simply be a false memory created by Agrigor. As a child, Kevin was defeated by Ben and trapped in a dimension called the Null Void. And the series retells the story of that time in Omniverse to explain Kevin is not half alien, but a human mutant who was used in experiments to combine human and alien DNA. The half alien children are introduced in Alien Force, but re-explained to have been test subjects created by a top secret plumber agency called the Rooters. The Rooters travel to Bellwood in search of their experiments, returning Kevin's memories and his mission to destroy the quote, coming storm. Kevin travels back to the Null Void to put a stop to the evil operatives, but he explicitly tells Gwen, Ben, and Rook not to follow him. However, they don't listen, and in a twist of events, Cervantes seems to convince Kevin that his purpose has always been to destroy his best friend, Ben, aka the coming storm. But Kevin has grown up and has a plan up his sleeve. He was only pretending to be bad to get close to the Rooters and ruin them, messing their whole thing up. I think this story is very fun, and it's really exciting to see Gwen and Kevin come back into the forefront for a little while. Kevin and Ben's adversarial relationship is always fun to return to every once in a while, and it is kind of fun and fresh to see that Kevin was just trying to get the old switcheroo on the villain. Retconning becomes a necessary tool in continued storytelling. Alien Force and Ultimate Alien retcon a lot from the original series because it was in the creative's interest. None of these things are necessarily better than one another. Additionally, an Ultimate Alien Agrigor was already built upon a false memory, so the idea that there's a second false memory doesn't seem that weird to me. Multiverses in franchise storytelling doesn't just exist for the amazing marketing potential that is crossovers. It also exists to illustrate to the audience that these are all different creative interpretations of these characters, their iterations. I remember I read a bunch of like Greek mythology in high school and somebody asked my teacher how Hercules can be Jason and the Argonauts if like the events of Hercules don't line up with the myth of Jason and the Argonauts. And my teacher just looked at him and said, don't worry about that. <sighs> Long running stories with deep continuity can be good, but new things can also be good. A different version of Kevin's origin doesn't make his alien father, Agrigor, disappear. He's just as real as ever. Both stories still exist and you do not have to pick which one you like more. You can just acknowledge their fiction and allow whichever story to resonate with you more. It's fitting that the most visually distinct Ben 10 show is Omniverse because people really hated this series art when it came out. I was searching for a clip from the show and I quickly found it on on YouTube, but the uploader decided to put text on the uploaded video saying he believed the art style was cancer, but the show was pretty good. I was like, geez, man, I just wanted to watch the clip. You didn't have to like throw that in there. Ben 10 into the Omniverse, I mean Ben 10 Omniverse, is a celebration of different iterations of superhero characters, and this show continues introducing and bringing back different versions of the Ben 10 mythology. Ben 10 Omniverse doesn't really end the series, but it's a view of the multiverse or the Omniverse, and the series timeline ends up creating a really great feeling that in my opinion makes the Ben 10 classic series feel full circle. Throughout the series, we've met so many different iterations of this character, and after some time travel stories, we learn that Ben 10,000 is indeed who Ben will grow up to be. We know where his story goes. His mythology has been established for a while now. Plenty of stories in Omniverse feature these alternate Bens, like when Ben 10,000, Gwen 10, Ben 23, and our Ben have to team up to protect a version of Ben who had never received the Omnitrix. Vilgax, Eon, and all these other evil versions of Ben come out of the nether to finally defeat Ben 10. In every single universe. Each Ben has its own stylized Omnitrixes with personalized designs that accompany their themes. I really like seeing Gwen's aliens and all the evil alien transformations. 
like emo Ben didn't have to happen, but it's very silly that it did. Vilgax betrays the evil Bens and destroys everyone who has an Omnitrix, leaving this Ben by himself with a new Omnitrix. He learns to be a superhero and bring everyone back, including the original Ben. In the final season of Ben 10 Omniverse, Ben once again gets a silly little gimmick. This is the slime bio, you know, like the symbiote, the thing that creates Venom and Spider-Man. The slime bio gives Ben like this really cool power up in exchange for a very obnoxious personality. Stop your nonsense. I drink your smoothie. I drink it up. The slime bio named Skurd allows Ben to equip powers from any of his transformations to one he's currently equipped with. Initially, Skurd was just a take on a concept Bandai wanted. Derek J. Wyatt explained it as something that would affect the Omnitrix in a way that will allow one alien to use the ability of another. They never made slime bio Ben 10 toys, funny enough. Skurd toys. Ah! Skurd's the name. But I do get the appeal of giving Ben like a familiar piece of equipment, I guess. <laughs> But it is weird, the series technically ends with Ben in the Slim Bio. More like the Slim Jim Bio. That's what I would do. Eat so many Slim Jims till my body starts looking like one. Well, as long as my pussy doesn't want me to. The final story arc of the show flips around the first story arc of the show when another villain comes into teenage Ben's life and claims to lay his seeds of victory he plans to take years later. The Time War wraps up Omniverse's final arc, which lets us peer into Ben and everyone else's future. We see all of our main cast alongside Ben 10,000 attending Grandpa Max's retirement party, all while maltruant and his goons and acting evil plan laid out years earlier against a teenage Ben when they laid the seeds of victory. Just like Malware did when Ben was a child all those moons ago. Maltruant is an evil version of Ben's transformation clockwork, a slow moving f***ing clock. Teenage Ben defeats Maltruant during a time traveling adventure that squeezes George Washington into the mix. Evil clockwork has an Annihilarg. It's gonna destroy the universe again, but feedback just blasts it back at him. He says, I will destroy the universe and Ben 10 says, no you. Maltruant is locked in a time loop doomed to experience his defeat over and over again. Again. After returning to his time and knowing what his future has in store, Ben calls his friends, Rook, Gwen, and Kevin to accompany him on a road trip. A promise to the audience that Ben 10 will continue to go on adventures. If the show didn't get canceled, this wouldn't have been how it ended, but I do think holding the door open for whatever or whoever comes into Ben 10 next is good. It's a nice note to end on, not like a final beat that cuts off the song, but a long fade out for Ben 10 tend to stay on our heads forever. With so much of the timeline explored, it feels like it comes full circle. Omniverse had a love and celebrated Ben 10 throughout its entire history. Ben 10 will always be an important part of Cartoon Network's identity, and they will always try to make it work for current audiences. Classic Ben 10 resonates with me a lot. It's very fun, but I don't need to continue indulging. I'm not sure if I'll check out the reboot, but it's been fun, dramatic, wholesome, silly, and all creative. But to me, it's the whole of all of these iterations and tones together that makes Ben 10 Ben 10. I have no doubt there will be another Ben 10 cartoon, another Ben 10 story with a darker tone, and more Ben 10 trying to appeal to a new generation of kids. I just hope along the way, a lot of cool creative people are allowed to come into the door and lend what they have to offer to the series. Let people bring their best work to the table. Thank you for being patient with me. See ya.